All right. Well, we are going to get started here in just a second as everybody logs in. We're excited to have everybody today. Oh, my friend Sheila's on. Hi, Sheila. <laughs> All right, well, we've got everybody logging in, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are so excited today. It's our first time having Carol Smith on with us. She's a longtime friend of um, Chuck and Emma and is an inspiration to the home building industry with all of her knowledge. So we're very excited to have her here with us today to discuss service leadership. Um, but before I pass it over to her, I just wanna get a few housekeeping items done. Today, the presentation will be recorded, so you're welcome to go back and revisit. The link will be on our website this afternoon. So if you need to revisit that, you can do that. Um, we, we do have um, the opportunity for question and answers, but I'm going to reserve the questions until the end of the presentation. That way we can have a nice flow and Carol can get through the material and you guys can ask questions whoever wants to stay on at the end. There are two speech bubbles down at the bottom. That's the button you're gonna wanna click if you have questions. Um, Carol did send out a um, booklet, a little workbook for you for today. Most of you, if you registered before yesterday afternoon, should already have the work, workbook. If for some reason you did not get the workbook, go ahead and send me a message with the in the chat function, that's the single speech bubble. Go ahead and send me a message there with your email and I can get the, I have an email set up and ready for whoever didn't get the workbook that I can send that out to you right away. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Carol. I'll turn off my camera and I will see you at the end for question and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma Jane. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm gonna jump right into this material because we have 135 slides to look at. Our topic this morning is service leadership. And this is such an important topic because the way management handles customer service is critically important to your customer satisfaction, your co company's future, your prosperity, your job security, all sorts of things are impacted by this aspect of our service plans. I want to remind you that customer service is defined very simply as one person doing something for one other person. And that something that's being done could be answering a question, returning an email, answering the phone, or building a house. So there are many possibilities to use to illustrate this. The idea is each of us has responsibility in this area. Interesting set of research uh, facts came out. Walker Research did a study a few years ago about what is important to customers, and they found that by the end of 2020, the customer experience had overtaken price and product as your brand differentiator. So you really want to focus on what is it like for your customer to navigate from the beginning to the end of the new home experience you provide. Let's begin by reviewing the benefits of service. Everybody knows, of course, one of the first benefits we all think about is repeat and referral sales. That is very legitimate. It is still very relevant and uh, something all of us definitely want to strive for. But there are many other things to consider. First of all, recognize that to make a happy customer, you want to work on two things. One is the customer's intellectual opinion. You want them to believe that they received a good product and a good process that was well organized. There's also the emotional side of this transaction. And that's where the customer feels he was well cared for, respected, looked after, communicated with, and so on. The emotional opinion is the stronger of the two. As we look at our reputation, then we want to make certain we're taking good care of the customer's emotional side. If he's proud of us and happy with what we've provided to him, he's going to help us reduce our advertising costs because he's sending us his friends and his colleagues. As a result, we can charge higher prices and make fewer concessions. You don't have to give garage door openers away if you have a good reputation. You can attract and keep talented employees in the area. And of course, you get more favorable terms with trade contractors. They want to work with builders they know will stay in business and be able to pay them. It's easier to conduct business generally, working with engineers, the building department, real estate people. 
It's just simpler to get along with them if they have respect for you and they think you are going to do a good job. It also feels good on a personal level to know you're contributing value to your community. And sometimes our Home Builders Association or other agencies uh, recognize our achievements and reward our professionalism. That feels pretty good, too. Individual employees, as I touched on earlier, have job security. They have opportunities for advancement, promotions, raises, and they're treated with respect generally by customers and colleagues. We can avoid conflict and stress. Nobody wants to go to work and be afraid to answer the phone. An interesting study out of uh, the University of Southern California, this was conducted by a professor in statistics, Dr. Ken Merchant. Um, he said an 8% increase in customer satisfaction results in an 8 to 19% increase in revenue. And that's where we see reflected the fact that you can charge higher prices. Get that level of satisfaction by delivering a good quality product. As a result, your warranty costs go down, somewhere between 17 and 24% according to this study. Now you combine all of this and the end result is an increase in profit, somewhere between 13 and 28%. I'll take a 13% increase in my income any day of the week. Same study also tells us that the sweet spot in customer service is actually 96%. You want to strive to achieve customer satisfaction Willingness to refer from 96% of your buyers. The fact of the matter is the other 4% of people are going to be so expensive to satisfy, you will never make the money back based on their referrals. Those are the folks who want the carpet replaced, and then they want the roof replaced, and then they want the house repainted, and then they want the backyard redone. You know the ones I'm talking about. Now, philosophically, you may want to strive for some number higher than 96%. I find 96% tough enough and challenging enough to achieve in and of itself. But I do have a few builder clients who've gone above that. They're probably spending more than what they need to. However, that's their choice as business people. Now let's focus on the role of service within your company. Many people tell me that they just want to meet legal obligations. I had a builder in New Orleans tell me once that his lawyer was his service department. Others want to simply prevent conflict with customers and stress on their staff. And of course, it's smart business if you earn repeat and referral sales. The ideal thing from my point of view is to combine all of those. You want to do all three of these things and to be successful, there's many little parts that need to come together correctly. Let's begin with recognizing that service is not a department. Customer service is an attitude. It needs to permeate your entire organization from sales all the way through warranty. I recommend that you call the warranty department new home warranty service and not simply refer to it as customer care or customer service. Yes, to other employees that they don't need to worry about service, there's a department that takes care of it. It also suggests to your homeowners that, oh, the customer care department will take care of this problem for me. When you call that department new home warranty service, that suggests there are measurements and standards and rules to be followed. Then if your warranty department does something extra and is especially generous, they might get a little extra credit for it. Here's a diagram of the zero to 100 scale. Some builders think the customer is always right and they do whatever the customer wants. They look good on the surface, but the problem with it is it runs up costs, and that means your future buyers have to pay more for their home. I'm not sure that's fair. On the other end of the scale, the lawyer being the service department is also not a wise move. I'd like to see builders be between 80 and 90% on this scale, and if you go a little over 90, that's just fine too. It's important for your company to also think about what is your threshold for customer dissatisfaction. If a customer is not happy, if they're yelling, if they're screaming, or if they're just simply frowning, you tolerate that. Is it their fault or is it your fault? Is it something that they misunderstood? Were you clear in communication? Or is it a failure in some aspect of the quality? You really have to analyze every different situation. But I find some companies are able to tolerate dissatisfaction much better than others. 
I'm not sure that's a good thing in all cases. But do think about that aspect of this. Also want to be ready to respond to new situations. The interesting thing about our industry is it changes every single day. Every time I think I now understand everything, something new comes up, usually before 8.30 in the morning. So be ready for that and don't be surprised by it. I'd like to recommend also that you engage in what I call flexible consistency. Companies develop policies, procedures, standards, and practices. They train their folks around those items. However, it's always possible that circumstances will come uh, to fruition that cause us to think, well, maybe that's not the right thing to do in this particular situation. It's perfectly okay to bend your own rules as long as you can identify the reason. It shouldn't simply be because, well, the superintendent over on that side of town has experience at another company and he likes doing it this other way that we don't do it in most of our communities, but we're going to let him do whatever he wants. That's not a good practice. When you exercise that kind of a practice, you end up with an inconsistency in how you care for your customers. By flexible consistency, what I mean is if there's an unusual circumstance in a particular area, whether it's a community, a product line, or a particular home, it's okay to make an exception to a rule, do something a little extra. You want to be able to articulate the reason. And that reason should be such that when other people hear it, they go, oh, of, well, yes, that makes sense under those circumstances. Not just a matter of personality or somebody being stubborn. Ask yourself now, what is your company's service philosophy? Let me give you some examples. This comes to us from Apple. Approach customers with a personalized warm welcome. Well, that's a pretty good thing. We want to address the emotional side of the relationship. Be polite ask questions, present a solution for the customer to take home, listen and resolve issues, have a fond farewell and an invitation to return. That's pretty thorough. Here's another one from Toyota. Talk about accuracy, kindness, and trust. All good things for home builders to consider as well. Every time I ask a home builder, what is your company's service philosophy? I'm frequently responded to with this. Do the right thing. Well, on the surface, that sounds pretty good. However, how do you define the right thing? And if you have 14 employees or 70 employees, will each of those individual people define the right thing differently? And what kind of a message is that sending to customers? Here's a sample philosophy I think has a little more meat on the bones. Deliver to the customer 100% of what was promised, on time, in good condition, and with a smile. Then you can go back through this and define each of the terms. 100% of what was promised. What expectations are we setting with our model home, our specifications, our selections processes, whatever practices you have in place for change requests. On time is when we tell the customer, we're going to give you 30 or 35 days notice before closing. That date that we provide at that point in time defines on time. In good condition simply means complete and clean, move in ready. And again, with a smile, we can't forget the emotional envelope of this uh, relationship. Now, nobody is going to accidentally saunder into this success. So we want to look at how we have to take steps one at a time, thoughtfully planned, in order to accomplish our goal. This is a great book by Chris McChesney. The two principal things a leader can influence when it comes to producing results, your strategy or your plan, and your ability to execute that strategy. Which of these do leaders struggle with more, creating a strategy or executing it? And I'm sure you'd agree with McChesney that executing is the problem. This brings us to the subject of walking the talk. Your first job in service leadership is to walk your talk. There are a couple of personal stories with you to illustrate. As Emerson said, what you do speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. Years ago, my phone rang. I answered it, and a voice said, I want to make you an offer you can't refuse. If anyone ever says that to you, please hang the phone up. 
I was foolish enough to listen to this gentleman, and he said to me, I would like to invite you to come to Columbia, Maryland, and, and work with me for a while. I've got somewhere between four and 500 homes under warranty, but I don't really know for sure because I don't have any files. I'd like you to come straighten this mess out. Well, I was foolish enough to get on a plane and go to Maryland, and I spent about four months working for that company. One of the things I encountered while I was there was a home that was delivered, supposed to have air conditioning, but the air conditioning installation had not been completed. Upon investigation, I found the company wasn't paying their trade contractors. Hmm, no uh, surprise there that people were resistant to coming back and finishing the work. So the family closed and moved in with the promise that the air conditioning would get fixed in the coming days. It was August. It was hot. It was humid. The grandmother lived with them. Between the stress and excitement of moving and the weather, she was really stressed out. Her son went charging into the sales office, yelling and screaming, complaining about the air conditioning not working. Well, it was a Saturday, so there were no construction people around to get help from. So what happened was the salesperson closed his sales office, drove into town, rented a room air conditioner, brought it out, and hooked it up in Grandma's bedroom. He got her glass of lemonade, and everybody calmed down. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to do. However, on Monday morning, when he went into the office for the sales meeting and brought the receipt for the air conditioner, that company owner took his head off. I am not paying for this. Don't you ever do that again. You work in sales. You do not work in construction. That air conditioner was not your responsibility. Mind your own business and keep selling. That's a mixed message simply because the same company owner stood up at all employee meetings speaking about the importance of customer satisfaction and how it was one of the principles he followed in operating his business, except he didn't walk his own talk. When we send our employees mixed messages like that one, they get very confused. They don't know from one day to the next what to do. And then they make mistakes and they get into trouble and they get scolded and then they end up next time not doing anything. Now here's an example from my past history. I worked for a company in Denver for about 13 years. My company owner called me one day when I was working in warranty. He gave me an address and he said, Carol, I want you to replace the front porch on this house. It's, it's just a mess. It's got to be fixed. I pulled the file on the house and I called the company owner back. I said, Tim, do you realize this house is 17 years old? He said, I don't care how old the house is. Porches don't fall off my homes. I had the pleasure of knocking on the door introducing myself to the fourth owner and asking them if it would be okay if we gave them a new front porch. Needless to say, they were pleased with my suggestion. That's an example of a company owner who walks his talk. John Young, the human resources executive for Four Seasons Hotel, says, with regard to customer service, first you must decide what you stand for. and Align every one of your systems to reinforce it. We need to be unified, we need to be consistent, we need to be cohesive. You recruit for it, select for it, orient for it. You train, reward, and promote for it. And you terminate those who don't have it. So let's take a look at your service DNA. Everything from hiring practices to job descriptions all the way through training, coaching, and communication with your people. I'd like to recommend that you develop within your company three sets of skills. First are proactive. This is where we educate our customers, set expectations, guide them, support them, remind them about things all the way through the process. This is the fun part. We also know we need recovery skills. An interesting study was done by the federal government using our tax dollars. This was conducted by the TARP Organization Technical Assistance Research Program. They enjoyed the results of the study so much they repeated it a couple of years later and got the same results. When we have a customer service problem, the customer is expecting you to recover. And that happens in five steps. First and foremost, be reliable. Do what you say you're going to do. Be responsive. Have enough energy and enthusiasm to get up from behind your desk and make an effort on behalf of the customer. Assurance was a little confusing to me, so I read some of the detail in the report. And what they were referring to there is courtesy, honesty, and respect. I expect those three things when I go into Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee. I'm certainly going to be looking for them if I buy a new home. 
Empathy is your ability to see a situation from the customer's side of the desk. It doesn't mean that the customer is crying. You have to cry too. But if you have empathy for what the customer is going through, that's probably going to motivate you to be responsive and try to find a way to help. Finally, notice good tangible product is item number five on this list. We hear all day every day about quality, appearance, cosmetic finishes, and so forth. But a good tangible product is number five on the list of what customers are wanting. First four items we create out of our commitment, our energy, our enthusiasm, our personality, and our time. Another set of skills we need in addition to proactive and recovery is defense skills. From time to time, we will run into one of those 3 or 4% of customers who are just looking for a little something extra, maybe trying to take advantage, lie, manipulate, control. We need to be prepared to defend our company and ourselves in those situations. Those kinds of conflicts can be individual or can involve an escalation. I define an escalation as a situation where the customer is jumping outside of the transaction. They're no longer just talking to their home builder. They're no longer just talking to their realtor. They are talking to the public in general. They're talking to their colleagues at work, their neighbors, their friends, their relatives. They might even put a sign in the front yard of their new home. So as we develop systems and a team to deal with these three sets of skills and use them effectively. We need to hire, fire, and promote appropriately. You want to have a team that is unified in their philosophy, all comfortable with the way you want customers treated so you don't have frustrating uh, interactions. It begins with selecting your people carefully and then orienting them thoroughly. You want them to understand how your company operates. And part of that is giving them an opportunity over the first few weeks of their employment to actually visit other departments in the company and see how things get done elsewhere. So if I work in the field as a construction superintendent, I need to know how the accounting people get checks out the door. I need to know how warranty operates. I need to spend some time hearing what salespeople tell customers in the first couple of visits. I also want to sit through a design appointment. In a similar vein, the warranty people need to spend time out in the field following superintendents around. When we begin to cross-train people and orient them to the other departments in our company, we're helping to foster a unified team that sees things the same way and approaches problems in a similar uh, attitude. Job descriptions are a practical portion of this. I've given you two examples. One is for a warranty manager, and the other is for a homeowner orientation host. Um, my job descriptions include categories showing how this particular person is going to interrelate with other departments that he works with on a regular basis in the organization. And so you see those examples in figures three and four. I also know that we can further support our team by having performance reviews. I like to see at least two of these every year. I know, I know they're not fun. A lot of managers hate doing them. But if you collect notes off and on as you work with your team, you'll make a list of the things they've done well and the places where they have opportunities to improve. Good performance review is going to be a dialogue, a two-way street, if you will, where you ask the employee, what would he or she like to be working on next? Is there some training we can send them to? Do they need support in negotiating or how to handle customers from other cultures? Ask them what they would like, what would help them do their job better, and then also make a suggestion. Not 10 suggestions, just one or two at the most. We don't want to demotivate our people. This information comes from account temps. Uh, criticizing your employees in front of others, certainly we don't want to do that. If you need to discipline someone, do it privately. Taking credit for others' work. I have a real problem with that one because of something that happened years ago when I was first out in the field working. I was actually teaching English at a vocational high school in Fremont, Ohio. The school was brand new. I was a first-year teacher, and the school had just opened. Well, we didn't have a curriculum for the English class, so I developed one. I based it on job skills, how to talk to customers, how to order parts and materials, how to deal with conflict, etc., etc. We didn't study poetry or Shakespeare. 
I didn't feel as if vocational students would always be interested in that. They could do that work for extra credit if they wanted to. Well, my curriculum was pretty successful. The director of the school went to a conference in Columbus, Ohio, and presented it with his name on it. I haven't quite ever gotten over my resentment about that. Other ways to demotivate your employees is failing to communicate and failing to train, being wishy-washy and so forth, showing excessive self-interest. You've all seen examples of that throughout your career. Impossible workloads, focusing on negatives, and money over quality. We saw an example of that with the home builder who wouldn't reimburse the salesperson for the air conditioning rental. Another caution, beware of the empowerment fairy. When I first started doing orientations full-time back in 1981, I was told that my job was to present the home, make the list, and then ensure that the construction team finished it. The only problem with that was I didn't have any authority over the construction people. I worked for the warranty office. The only thing I could do was kind of an elbow to the ribs. Hey, come on, get this done for this home buyer. We don't want him to get angry. Over time, I figured out how to develop authority. I began that process by circulating reports about the warranty items uh, that were showing up that were actually still from the orientation. That statistical data was circulated through the superintendents and the salespeople and the design selection people as well as the warranty office. Everybody wanted to know why this was happening. That's how I got their attention, and the problem eventually got resolved. It took about 11 months, but we made good progress. I want to turn our attention now to something that happened in the 90s. Our industry had a trend that was called customer delight. Worked in home building back then. You may remember we took people's pictures on their new home site. We baked them fresh cookies at their design appointment. And we thought that that was an improvement in customer service. Well, it was a good start, but it didn't go nearly deep enough. I think the term experience engineering gives us the muscle that we need. So let's skip over customer delight. You can have that off on the side. There's nothing wrong with baking cookies for people. But we really need it as an industry to roll up our sleeves and dig into this subject with a little more vigor. First of all, we recognize our customers cannot not have an experience. So what is that experience going to be like? How can we plan it? How, we, how can we control it so that it is successful? Experience engineering is a good mindset for this problem. Tackle this challenge with the idea that you are going to look at absolutely every detail, every document, every conversation, every model home, every site visit, every meeting agenda, homeowner guide page by page from front to back. We're going to look for typos. We're going to add artwork where we can. We're going to add fun touches like the cookies and the photographs and so forth. But we're also going to be very critical of ourselves. Let's eliminate we've always done it this way thinking. Take a fresh look and set new standards of practice. I want the experience you provide to your customer to be a place and a time where he feels like, wow, I wish every product I bought was handled this well. Design an experience that's worth repeating, and that means end-to-end, -end, every department and every employee. This is going to require constant attention and ongoing improvement. It is not static. It does not stay put. You'll have to come back and review it. You'll tweak it. You'll throw something out and create something new. Your employees will come in with ideas. Your customers will give you feedback. You even get feedback from realtor, realtors and trade contractors. Listen to those people. They have worthwhile ideas. So experience engineering is comprehensive. Figure 6 talks about this. I especially want to emphasize the third bullet on that page. It's page 10 in your handout. Include choice where possible. There are many steps in our process where the buyer doesn't have a choice. He has to pay for this. He has to sign up for that. He has to transfer utilities. He has to arrange homeowner insurance. He is or is not allowed out to visit the site with or without an appointment and so on and so forth. Where you can in your system, give him choices so he has a sense from time to time that he has a say in this. He has some control and input. And please take note of the very last bullet. Take note of individual interests, your customer's personality. 
It's important in today's world, as the Walker Research pointed out, that we notice the customer as a person. He is not just an account number. He's not just a lot number. So experience engineering is predictable. It's consistent. It's cohesive. It's deliberate. In, when I say it's integrated, what I mean is from one department to the next to the next, the customer feels the same level of quality and attention to detail. I want to give you a very real-world illustration of what I'm talking about. I was in Gulfport, Mississippi, conducting an assessment for a builder there. So I was spending four days with them observing all of their processes. I also read all of their documents and walked their job sites. When I went to the selection studio to observe a design appointment. I arrived about 15 minutes before the appointment time. I waited in the reception area. The customer arrived. The receptionist greeted the customers by name, buzzed into the design studio, and immediately a young lady came out, greeted them by name, and took all of us down a hallway that literally had a red carpet. On both sides, the walls were covered with beautiful photographs of the homes the builder had created. When we arrived in the design studio, it also was well organized, beautifully appointed, very easy to navigate the process. At the end, when all of the final choices were being input into the computer, a lady came out from the closing department with refreshments for the buyers to entertain them while they were waiting for their paperwork to come back for signatures and final review. If your appointment was in the morning, you were offered fruit and yogurt. If it was in the afternoon, you had a choice of cheese and crackers and a beverage. And the beverages included iced tea, a soda, a seltzer, or a glass of wine. Same company, the next day, I observed a frame stage tour, and I took these photographs during that meeting. Quite a contrast to the lovely, well-planned meeting in the selection studio. The customer was with me as I took these pictures. The house needed to be swept out. Wrinkled, tattered, torn blueprint that is sitting on top of a stack of drywall is the blueprint for this home. As we walked the home, the customer pointed out a mistake. The superintendent didn't have an agenda. He didn't have anything to write on because, of course, he figured his home was perfect and he wouldn't have any problems to, to note. He went over to the drywall stack, and with a pencil, he wrote on the stack of drywall a note to himself to correct the problem the customer had noted with a cold air return. It was unprofessional. It was sloppy. didn't feel reliable. And the really difficult part is it was such a contrast to the earlier meeting. When customers are up on one meeting and down on the next, they begin to lack trust. They begin to get uncomfortable because they don't know what's coming next. They can't rely on you. They don't feel as if things are consistent or predictable. Here's another area where we have opportunities. In our sales offices, we have beautiful four-color brochures, fantastic photographs, absolutely perfectly written scripts, really interesting, good quality paper, sometimes with tissue paper inlays. They must cost a fortune. Then the customer moves in, and he gets paperwork from warranty. Often looks like this. Obviously, I've hidden the name of the company to protect the guilty. Clearly a copy of a copy of a copy from probably several years ago. How can we say to the customer with a straight face that warranty service is important and we really respect what they need to have corrected in their home? Our paperwork looks like this. Another example of inconsistency. When you have a patchwork quilt in your paperwork, it's easy to fix it, but you have to notice it first in order to get that done. Here's another tiny example of something to look for. I often see forms with information sort of thrown together at the top. You'll notice some of the categories are capitalized, some have colons after them, the lines aren't even. So much better to use a table. Now, interestingly enough, once you've created a table that includes all the details you almost always need, you can save it in a file, open it, copy it, and create the next form quickly, easily, conveniently, and have them all match. Here's a set of customer meeting agendas. They all use that same table at the top. Another table contains the agenda. A third contains the action items. Please always have room for action items to be noted at your customer meetings. It's extremely arrogant to think you're going to have a meeting with a customer and not come away with at least one question or one follow-up detail. 
supplemental meeting notes form in the bottom right corner can be used to note any items that don't fit on the original meeting agenda. For example, the primary warranty visit that you see right here doesn't have a lot of space because the agenda is so long. So if I have more than two items to note, I can attach this form and list whatever else needs to be noted. In that way, I have a professional record. Now this can be electronic or it can be paper copy. But the idea is pay attention to every detail. We want to show a passion for attention to detail and making sure that everything is of good, high quality. If you're using a form to make copies from for a, uh, meetings with customers, always copy from an original. It's not that difficult once you get the problem or the system set up. Let's get off of paperwork and start looking at our job sites. I took this picture in the backyard of a home. I won't mention the builder, but I took the picture during the orientation. The homeowners were in the house when I took the photo. They had four young children. I would look at this if I had four young children and be worried about their safety playing in the backyard until this got cleaned up. Same community, different home. This one's still under construction. It was, however, sold. If this was your hall bathroom and your two-year-old son was going to take a bath in that tub, what would you think if you saw this? Same house. This is the kitchen, again, demonstrating definitely respect for the product. Same house, bedroom windowsill. I don't want to just pick on construction. Up in Alberta, Canada, this is the entryway to a builder's model. Welcome to our model home. Now, this company advertises old world craftsmanship and attention to detail, a passion for quality. Yes, we can see all of that quite clearly in this welcome mat in front of the model home door. Let's look at some tiny behaviors we can engage in. I think it's important to all have the habit of when a customer walks in, we stand up and greet them. If you're on the phone, interrupt your call briefly, greet the customer, end the call quickly, and deal with your customer. All of these little things, cleaning up the welcome mat, making sure our trades treat our homes with respect, us demonstrating body language that shows respect for our customer, all of this comes together to create a really effective customer service program. In addition to that, you can set some standards for how your company communicates. Universal service guidelines or universal communication guidelines can manage the raw material of your business day. Now, the raw material of a business day includes in-person conversations, phone calls, emails, meetings, all of the ways we communicate with our customers. One of the first things to consider as you develop this material is eliminating what I call the echo of your ex. The echo of the ex is when an employee who comes to your company with experience from maybe one or more other building companies keeps using the vocabulary from those other companies. This can end up with a customer hearing five different terms for a particular meeting. They might hear eight different names for the homeowner orientation. It's confusing to the customer it also can imply that there are more meetings going to happen, more services included, than there actually are. So what we want to do to prepare for this is create a home builder glossary. There's an example of one in Figure 7 of your handout material. Now, it's not 100 pages long. It's about a page and a half. We're going to cover the names of meetings, the names of our documents, and job titles. You can add other things to it if you want to. But the fact of the matter is, if we can include this in our employee manual, include it in some of your training materials, talk about it from time to time at regular staff meetings and remind people it exists and they should be familiar with it. We can get everybody on the same page using the same vocabulary. It can help avoid confusion and make us look more polished and professional. In addition to that, we also want to plan our meetings carefully. There's a customer meeting matrix or customer meeting well, worksheet in your handout. It's two pages long. It includes several dozen questions to consider as you plan your processes for your meetings. This gives us a systematic approach for organizing all of this effort. Our meeting system is a critical element of aligning customer expectations and at the same time, 
It provides us with a mechanism, a structure, if you will, for communicating with them all the way through the process. So when we take these two pages, feel free to modify them and add more or change the points if you want to. But when we take these two pages and we plan every meeting according to these questions, some of them you may skip for particular meetings, but most of them apply to every meeting. The end result, once you've written it down, first of all, is a tangible evidence of the effort you've put into planning this relationship, but most importantly, it gives you training material to use to educate and help your frontline staff practice. One of the subjects we want to cover with our customers, and I recommend doing this early, so that means in the sales office, letting them know how we're going to communicate. It's become increasingly important in recent years because everybody has a cell phone and everybody expects to send t text messages back and forth and have responses in five seconds. Well, that doesn't always work for those of us who work in the home building industry. Sometimes we're with another customer or in a meeting at our office and we can't respond quickly. Let's let the customer know we can do that as shown in Figure 9. This is a page from the introduction of my homeowner guide template. And by the way, if you don't have a good homeowner guide, let me know. I'll be happy to email you the files. My homeowner guide is about 170 pages, and it includes eight chapters. The newest chapter, the last one, is homeowner association information. So this is the introduction, and what you see is some bullets talking about how we expect to communicate. First of all, notice that we're asking the customer whether he prefers phone or email. In the second bullet, we let the customer know that we resist the temptation to send text messages about important details regarding his home. Home is too complicated, too significant, and too expensive to risk information back and forth in text messages. I don't want to get a text message from a customer that says, hey, we've decided not to do the change request for the fireplace, please cancel it. I want that one in writing where I can print it. I want their signature on that decision. Third bullet says we intend to respond, at least acknowledge your communication within one workday. And notice this information is supplemented at the bottom of the page with our work schedules. The customer, for instance, will know that the sales consultant is off on Thursday. So if I email my sales consultant Wednesday night at 10 o'clock, I don't expect an answer on Thursday. I know she's off on that day. All of this information helps create expectations, and if we spend a few minutes talking with the customer about it, we can develop a comfort level, help them to stay calm and keep ourselves out of trouble. It's also useful in today's world, and again, this can happen in the sales office, to get a buyer profile. Example in Figure 10, I'm sure you can come up with a better one for your particular communities. But notice halfway down, I ask about home purchase experiences. They've had a negative experience in the past. I need to know about that so that I can be especially attentive, sensitive to their questions and their concerns. I don't want to step on those injured nerves from the past. I want to ask about other family members. Do they have in-laws living with them? Do they have an elderly aunt and that type of thing? And notice the last item. What are their food preferences? What a silly thing to ask, but here's why. Builder was passing out at um, closing a nice food basket. It was a very generous gift, had a lot of great things in it. And one customer called after he received his and thanked the company and said, that was very thoughtful of you. I really appreciate the gesture. However, I'm on a gluten-free diet. I can't eat anything in this fruit, uh, food basket. And that was when that company decided they needed to ask about food preferences on their buyer profile. That information can be useful in your design appointments where you offer the customer refreshments because the meeting lasts for four hours. All of this information comes together to give us tools, gives us a way to manage each customer on a personal level. Documents are not the most enjoyable part of our process, but they are critical, so we're going to focus our attention on that. The fact of the matter is, when we document our practices, our policies and procedures, we create that service textbook. Now, we want to balance between having too much and too little. If your service textbook is 700 pages long, it's going to be difficult for your staff to digest all of it. So zero in on the things that are most critical 
the ones that are really going to create customer satisfaction. By creating a written document that shows how you do what you do, you create some really wonderful support tools. First of all, you're harvesting knowledge. What if your best employee, your most experienced, successful uh, employee left the company, decided to retire, or go start his or her own company, or just move to another state uh, because his or her spouse got a job transfer and they couldn't resist taking it? All of their knowledge would walk out the door with them. So let's talk about how they do what they do, why are they successful, and put it in writing. This helps us to clarify any points of confusion. A really great thing in case there's a problem is we might have a solution we've already figured out from past experience that can help us replace crisis management. These written procedures oftentimes call attention to teamwork. perfect example would be a written procedure for managing change requests. Now those often begin in the sales office or the design studio. They typically go to construction and purchasing, then they go back to the salesperson or the design studio consultant, and then they go back to the customer. So it bounces around, takes several days, usually to maybe a week or more, to get settled and signed and paid for. As you write that up in a written procedure, you can see that teamwork and realize how all of those people need to communicate to, together. Figure 11 is a sample outline for a customer service manual, a customer service guidebook. You'll notice that it begins with universal communication protocols, how we're going to handle phone calls, emails, meetings, and documents. Then it goes through the process chronologically from sales through closing and then into warranty. See, there's quite a bit about warranty. Some of the details of warranty are very complex, and the more processes we figure out that are helpful and supportive to our task, the better off we're going to be. If you look at page 19, there's a chapter called Service Diplomacy. It talks about how we communicate with customers when they say things or ask us questions, answers to which sometimes get us into trouble. For example, number 818, I used to work in construction. Well, why didn't you build your own house if you know so much about it? That really isn't a good answer. A better response is, I'm so glad to hear that. So many of my customers don't know there's more than one right way to do things in home building. Where was it you worked in construction? No kidding, Juneau, Alaska. Wow, how exciting. When was that? 1973. And things have still ch really changed, haven't they? Tell me how you did this in Juneau back then. We do it here now like this because... They have a good conversation that actually strengthens the relationship and shows respect for the customer. As you develop your policies and procedures, clear on the distinction between the two, and I make this distinction because of the way I format this material. We'll look at an example in a minute. Policy simply describes attitude or a simple one-step response. They usually don't have any supporting paperwork, possibly with the exception of a confirming letter. The so policy is pretty straightforward. A procedure is going to describe a multi-step process and usually involve documentation. Many of them involve multiple staff members. So figure 12 is an example of a policy. This one is for out-of-town buyers. Notice the first item on it is the objective. The home buyers who live out of town stay informed. We want them to be comfortable have a challenge with our out-of-town buyers. We don't spend as much time with them. It's a little more challenging to develop a healthy relationship and earn their trust. So by setting up a system to communicate with them from time to time as they go through the process and pay a little more attention to them when they are in town, we can contribute to that positive relationship. Procedures, as I said, are a little more complicated. An example in Figure 13 illustrates. First of all, the objectives are two items. We want our customers to be delighted and to acknowledge their orientation items have been completed. The procedure is the responsibility of the superintendent. The person responsible for doing the procedures is typed in italicized print to call attention to that. Some procedures, like the change request, bounce back and forth among several staff members. Materials are listed and then can be attached to the procedure have success measures and training activities. Those are both optional items, but I find them to be useful in most cases. It forces us to think about how are we going to help our personnel get to know this, 
how will we help them master performing this particular procedure? The attachment for this one is seasonal work list. This is because when we're completing orientation items in the middle of winter and there are exterior things that cannot be done, such as paint, uh, concrete flat work, and so forth, we need to keep track of it. We want an accurate record so when warmer weather comes back again, we can quickly follow up. Now, the fact of the matter is in today's world, I would add supply chain issues because I know that right now every once in a while we deliver a home missing a dining room chandelier or maybe the shower enclosure or maybe even a bathroom sink. It's kind of interesting how uh, much chaos is being created by our pandemic situation. But we want to respond to it with a system that shows our customer we're documenting their issues, we are not going to forget about them, and this makes it easy and efficient for us to stay on top of those. Also a good idea to stay in touch with customers who are still waiting for parts. Let them know every couple of weeks via phone call or email that you have not forgotten them, because after a while, if they don't hear from you, they'll begin to wonder. Your customer service guidebook, and call it whatever you want, you call it a service manual if you want, and also include such things as company certification programs where an employee has not only demonstrated that he or she has mastered their procedures for their job, but they've also taken some classes. Perhaps they've had some coaching from fellow employees or from their manager. You might also want to create a company library, a resource library that can include audio programs, periodicals. It could include a library of books. Uh, certainly the opportunity for people to mentor each other. Support tools that we have are numerous. Many times I find we don't take full advantage of them. Your support tools include everything from your website to your quality control checklist. So take a look at all of those and ask yourself, are they coordinated? Do they look uniform? Are they of similar quality all the way through? I saw a slide presentation for one of our major Colorado Springs builders the other day. And they asked for my feedback on it, and I went through it with my red pen, being a former English teacher. Had a lot of fun finding punctuation mistakes, spacing errors, uh, capitalization was inconsistent. There was even one sentence that had the word your two times in it. Clearly, they haven't proofread it carefully. It was easy for me to mark everything up, and it will be easy for them to correct it. We just need to take the time to put forth the effort. Education and training is also another critical leadership uh, responsibility. We want to make sure that we plan to help our staff. We want to support them. We want to guide them. We want to make certain that any new procedures come across clearly and our personnel on the front line have an opportunity to ask questions. Education and training are two distinct different things. In my world, education is the strategy, idea of this. Why are we doing this this way? What's the point? What are we trying to accomplish? What are our goals? Training is the hands-on practice for how do you actually implement whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. So we would talk, in, uh, for example, about the importance of the homeowner orientation, helping the customer become familiar with his home so that he can use it effectively, maintain it properly, understand when to ask warranty for help. And then the training is actually go out to a house and walk the home, practice the conversations you would have if you were presenting that home to a customer. As a management team, you can take time to do a needs assessment. I would do this about once a year, maybe November, December, so you can plan training for the upcoming year. Ask your employees for their feedback. Pay attention to comments you get in customer surveys and other methods of customer feedback. Ask your employees' supervisors what they think the employees need. And then finally, as a management team, sit down and look at the big picture. What are the new areas that your company is focused on for the upcoming year? Training elements that you can put into place to support your goals. In terms of long-term planning for training, you're going to need to consider the practical details of the schedule. People are being trained. They're not on the front line doing their job. Certainly there will be some cost involved in this. Where will you get the instructors? 
is there a class at the local uh, college, perhaps a university, perhaps through the Home Builders Association? What other resources might be available? Online classes can be effective. I much prefer to work in person, but with pandemic, we've all had a lot of practice doing online meetings. So I think people are way more comfortable with them now than they were two years ago. Cross-training is another vital element. This is where we help our employees understand how other people do things. And a lot of times you will find that they really enjoy learning about how other people function in other departments. It can lead to some really good suggestions when, say, someone from warranty goes out and observes, observes a design appointment. They can make some suggestions. It can really help the design team be more effective with customers. And at the same time, the warranty rep goes back understanding why sometimes customers don't know how to take care of a hardwood floor. To work with your employees, you want to make sure you're gaining buy-in. And buy-in means that they feel a sense of belonging. They want to support the organization. They want it to be successful because that brings them success as well. All of this means having a dialogue, recognizing what they contribute, showing appreciation to their suggestions for improvement and so forth. That sense of empowerment really encourages people to come to work enthusiastic, ready to roll up their sleeves and do better each and every day. Their participation helps to foster this sense of uh, commitment. And as you develop that, you will see wonderful ideas come to the table. They'll bring suggestions of something they saw that happened in a department store, automotive repair shop, or a restaurant. You'll be able to interpret it and apply it to your service practices. When you show appreciation to your employees, be specific. I heard that conversation that you had with Mr. Jones. You handled his objections beautifully. I was really proud of that, and, and I thought that he left that meeting feeling much better about the questions that he had as well, so good job. I want your appreciation to sound sincere, and it needs to happen soon after the event that you observed. Personalize it as much as you can. You don't want to just go down the hall patting people on the back saying, hey, thanks, good job without any specifics. Years ago, I attended a career track seminar about coping with problem employees. The speaker, a gentleman named Vern Harnish, gave us this acronym. He said, when you have a problem employee, it almost always falls into one of three categories. You can represent the categories by the acronym ASK. It's their attitude, it's our system, or it's their knowledge. You can fix their knowledge with training if they're willing to learn. If the system is bad, it could be computer, it could be paperwork, it could be the timing of a procedure. You can fix that once you recognize it. But if the employee's attitude is bad, my experience has been you have about a 25% chance of correcting that. Years ago, I worked with a warranty administrator. He had been the warranty administrator for eight years. I came into the department as the orientation host and two years later was promoted to be head of the warranty department. Well, Ginny thought she should have been head of the warranty department. After all, she had been there longer. Well, too bad I got the job. The fact of the matter is it showed in her attitude. I heard her being snippy on the phone with customers and with trade contractors. She was short and rude to fellow employees. One afternoon, about six weeks later, Dragon Lady came into my office. Now, Dragon Lady was the administrative assistant for the owner of our company. She closed the door. Never a good sign. She sat down and she said, Carol, I need to tell you to fire Jenny. I said, why? She said, well, a personal friend of the company owner bought one of our homes. Jenny didn't know he was a personal friend of the owner, and she was extremely rude to him on the phone the other day. She needs to go. I said, Linda, I have noticed since I took over the department that her attitude has gone downhill. I, she resents it that I got promoted and she didn't. However, she is like an encyclopedia. I can give her an address and she can tell me the color of the carpet in the house. I don't want to lose that right now. Let me do this if it's okay with you. We'll talk with her and I will ask her to improve her behavior and her attitude. If it doesn't improve in 30 days, I will absolutely let her go. Linda agreed to that, 
And after Linda left my office, I went out to Jenny, and I said, Jenny, what are you doing after work tonight? She said, nothing. What would you have in mind? I said, would you like to go get a glass of wine? She said, sure, that sounds like a great idea. So after work, we went to the Chinese restaurant across the street, sat in the lounge, and had a glass of wine. And I looked her straight in the eye, and I said, Jenny, Dragon Lady came into my office today and told me to fire you. Right between the eyes, I had to tell her the truth, and I had to get it out quickly. I needed to get her attention. Here's why, here's what's wrong, here's what needs to happen. Today is Wednesday. I want you to take Thursday and Friday off, come back Monday with a different attitude. I don't want to lose you. She did that. She came back Monday, and I don't know if she was faking it, but she was a different person. Years later, I resigned. I went out on my own to become a consultant. I was a consultant for seven years. I had contact with that same organization, and Ginny was a vice president. The fact of the matter is I didn't beat around the bush. I had to tell her exactly what was wrong, and sometimes that's the only way you can fix an attitude problem. With regard to that acronym, I would add one more letter, and that's T for time. If an employee has a good attitude and the system's adequate and their knowledge is fine, if they don't manage their time well, they can still run into problems. So we want to make sure that our folks have good time management skills. Coaching might touch upon that. There's a sheet in Figure 14 that asks some uh, key points about spending some time coaching your folks. This sheet can be used for peers to coach each other or for managers to coach their team. Either way, the end result should be some success and some progress. Recognition when people make progress, when they succeed, when they offer a good suggestion that improves some process or quality point in the product is always important. We want to let them know we appreciate their thinking and their contribution. In addition to that, we want them to feel involved. As I mentioned before, participation creates enthusiasm. So it's important that we have a good communication system within our company. Figure 15 is a chart that I adapted from The Myth of Multitasking by David Crenshaw, a delightful little book, by the way. This is a tool to give us an analysis of our meetings. Are they effective? Just having the meetings because, well, we've always had them. Do we really need them as often as we're having them and so on and so forth? Are the right people there? As you go through your meetings, you may find some of them need to be adjusted. You should have an all-employee meeting at least once a year. Some companies have them twice a year, some every quarter. They are important for keeping people updated about what other departments are doing, what is working, what's a challenge, what are we focused on for the next several months. That is a great opportunity to build enthusiasm. They don't take a lot of time, but they're vitally important to a unified sense among your team. And there's also management meetings where heads of departments get together. I like to see a basic written agenda of topics that are considered at each one, along, of course, with any new business that anyone needs to bring up. In addition to meetings where we get face-to-face -face or face-to-computer screen and talk, we can also circulate reports to keep people informed about what's going on. These are appropriate for things that are repetitive. The orientation item report we have here is the top 10 items for the interior of the home. It shows which houses had too many items and which had a more reasonable amount. This helps us to focus in on where might there be a problem and what could it be. I'd be asking the question, what happened at the Andrews home? The Andrews expectations that were out of alignment or was the home really just not ready for the orientation? Another type of report is a state of the department memo. You probably have reports in your own company that demonstrate a, a greater variety than the ones we're looking at here as examples. But this one was one page. This is what I used when I worked in the warranty office to keep my boss, who was the CEO of the company, informed about what I was working on, tell him my thoughts or the direction I was going so if I was getting off track, he could stop me before I got into any trouble. This helped him feel comfortable that he knew what was going on in the warranty office without having to come back there and spend time sitting in. Departmental meetings are where you get your team together typically once every week or two weeks, and you share thoughts, you talk about questions, maybe do a little training segment at each one. The community team meeting, on the other hand, cuts horizontally across departments. These typically involve the salesperson, the construction superintendent for the community, 
It might also include the design selection consultant and or the warranty representative. As they get together once every week or two, they talk about issues in the community, uh, bring each other up to date on homeowner situations, and share any news about trade contractors, the developer, and so forth. Speaking of trades, there's a job description in Figure 18. This is probably appropriate for larger companies. But if you're a smaller company and you look through some of the tasks and duties listed, you might find several of them that are applicable to your organization, even though you don't have the formal trade liaison position. It's just a way to keep in touch with trades, tap into that source of communication and expertise, and make sure there aren't any problems brewing that you're not aware of. We want to recognize that in today's world we have labor and supply issues. How do we share this information with customers without sounding like we're whining and complaining about it? I think a simple approach is to have a nice, neat little bulletin board in the sales office with recent, and by recent I mean within the last 60 days, articles about this issue. We want to keep this current and not have something up there that's two years old. This is a method for the salesperson to talk about this, referring to third-party objective observations. Much better to do that than to simply say, well, we can't get and we don't know and all of those whiny kinds of comments. Challenge is our problem to deal with. Unfortunately, we are unable to completely protect you from it. You may find that when you move into your home, you're missing the back porch light fixture and you have a bare bulb sitting there. We keep track of all this. You could even show the customer the form that you use in warranty to track that. And again, this business news needs to be current. You want to keep an eye on it and make sure that when it gets updated, you take the old article down. Pending warranty repairs, like finishing houses, this is another area where things are dragging just a little bit. It's harder and harder with the trade contractors being overworked and parts being unavailable to get our warranty work cleaned up. Critically important that on the back end of this in the administrative function, we are keeping careful records of who needs what so that we don't forget someone and have them get upset with us. Our customer meetings are a tool for managing all of this. And sadly, some of our customer meetings uh, have suffered in the pandemic. Hopefully this thing is coming to an end. I'll be glad when it does. I'm sure all of you will be too. In the meantime, we do have some things in the appendix that can help you explain this situation to the customer. Feel free to modify those as needed. Your routine updates of your system are going to be ongoing. And again, I recommend reviewing everything at least once a year. This is a race with no finish line. You're never going to say, okay, we're done with our customer satisfaction program. It's ready. It's finished. It's good. It's going to continue to evolve. New issues will continue to hit your desk, and you'll need to respond to them. Sometimes you will need to seek uh, support from your legal team. There may be ethical issues involved that require immediate adjustments in your processes, and when that's the case, call a meeting, have a training session, explain to your people why this needed to be changed and what they're going to be doing instead of what they've been doing. They'll have a few questions and then everybody can move on. Check back later and make sure they don't have any follow-up questions. As you get new ideas, take a good hard look at them. If you're uncertain but they sound good on the surface, try the technique of doing a trial run in one small area, maybe one community or one product line, and just see how it works. Maybe you fine-tune it there, and then you can roll it out in the rest of the company. You might want to organize a task force to conduct an annual review of all these practices. You could have a representative from sales, one from construction, design, warranty, perhaps even the closing department, and have them sit down and just look at things. They can each bring in from the rest of their colleagues suggestions from the field. Once you've decided on new techniques, educate and train, give people practice and time to ask questions. Change will be difficult for some of your employees, and we want to be aware of that. Coping with change usually involves us going through four stages. The first one is, oh, no, this can't be good. I just got used to what we were doing before. 
and we move into resistance. I don't want to deal with this. I've got enough on my mind. Can't these people just leave this stuff alone? They're changing just for the sake of change. That's part of the, we've always done it this way. It's worked fine in the past. What are we doing? Well, we're moving forward. It's a new model year, and the, the product is different. Okay, I give up. If you're going to insist, how can I make this work for me? And I start to explore. I start to experiment. And pretty soon, hey, this works pretty good after all. You should try it. Now you know you've achieved conquering that change. Great little book if you haven't come across it already. I really enjoy the writing of Chip and Dan Heath. Um, very practical, very down to earth, and usually pretty well written. The book Switch talks about change and how to manage it. Uh, it's really quite useful. They take the approach that change involves three elements. Motivation is represented by the elephant, strong, energetic, determined. The direction is the rider. That's the mental part of it, figuring out, okay, how are we going to do it different? And the path would include the support tools, the form, the training, the quality control aspect of this. Another book on change says we go through eight steps as managers. First, we envision the new results. We communicate that vision to our team to try to get them excited. We involve them in the planning and allow them to ask questions and poke holes and raise issues. They can play devil's advocate if they want. When we're finally ready to roll this out, we train them, then we coach them. We track the results. And when we succeed, it's a good idea to celebrate because you went to a lot of work to make this happen. So we've started out talking about the benefits of customer service, and then we looked at several different aspects. and role of leadership in managing all of these moving parts. It is not an easy task. It's very complicated. It's one of the most challenging aspects of service work. Warranty work has a reputation of being pretty tough and pretty challenging, pretty difficult, and pretty frustrating. I can attest to that. No homeowner ever called me and said, good morning, Carol. Nothing's wrong in my house today. But the fact of the matter is managing all of these moving parts is a pretty daunting task, especially when you have other duties and assignments within your company. The appendix figures 19 and 20 talk about the virus. Um, again, hopefully we won't need to use any of this for very much longer, but uh, I'm convinced that we've got at least a few weeks, if not longer, in front of us yet. Let's be cautious and keep everybody safe. And at this point, I will take whatever questions anyone has. Emma Jane, anybody have any questions for us? Wow, Carol, that was amazing. So much great information. Thank you so much for sharing today. We do You're have a welcome. couple we do have a couple of questions. Beth, um, it looks like she had to sign off, but she wanted to know how to calculate the increase in customer satisfaction. Um, one of the best ways is to have a relationship with a third party survey company. Some builders do surveys in-house, and that's fine, too, as long as you're honest with yourself. But what we want to be looking for is, first and foremost, straightforward, honest, candid manner, where are we right now? Everybody wants to pretend that they're doing better than they are. One kind of amusing story, I was working for one of our major national builders on this topic, and I flew into their city. Landed on a Friday night. Saturday, I met with the vice president of operations, and he assured me that their customer satisfaction was absolutely off the chart. But we were just going to double check and make sure because the company owner had asked him to do that. We had interviews scheduled with three homeowners. We went to the first home, which was a town home. We introduced ourselves. A very nice married couple invited us in. We sat at the dining room table. They'd offered us uh, coffee and blueberry muffins. And we introduced our subject and said, tell us what it was like to work with ABC Homes. And the wife burst into tears. Two hours later, we left with pages and pages of notes. I got back in the car with this vice president of operations, and he looked at me and said, we're not as good as we think we are, are we? <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I saw the commercial on TV with the old lady who threw the tire through the plate glass window. Builders <laughs> think because nobody's doing that that everybody's happy. That's not the case. Customers are frustrated with different parts and different pieces. If we don't start the dialogue and ask the question, we can't know. 
70% of them who have a complaint are not going to come and tell the company unless you ask. And even then, you don't always get the full story. But you've got to start the dialogue. So I would put into place some survey systems of some type. If you don't want to do formal third-party surveys, you can do what I call transaction surveys. These are short four- and five-answer uh, questions that they can answer in just 90 seconds. But it creates a dialogue. So right after their pre-construction meeting, I'm going to email them a pre-construction transaction survey. Did the meeting start on time? Was the agenda relevant? Was the information useful? Were all of your questions answered? Do you have any other comments? It doesn't take long to say yes, no, and write a couple of notes on that and shoot it back to us. If we send that out the day after the pre-construction meeting, if a customer is unhappy, frustrated, or worried about something, we're going to tap into that, and that gives us a chance to immediately jump on that and correct it. Excellent. That's great advice, Carol. Um, I have another question here. Um, this is from Ryan. He um, says they try very hard to beat industry average survey scores. They're not perfect, believe they, but they believe they do a better job than average customer experience. They try very hard to deliver what is promised, but still find that if there's one thing that happens to go wrong along the way, they receive a low survey score. He's starting to believe the only way to achieve 96 plus percent is to give in and put money towards things above what we promised. What are we missing? Oh, you're not missing anything. You're doing everything right, and you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Your customers aren't perfect, and yes, things are going to go wrong. And when that happens, we need to say to the customer, we apologize that this happened. Let us see what we can do. Again, this starts with the dialogue. If your survey scores are not where you want them to be, just keep looking at the patterns. You want to look for what keeps repeating. What is the context of the problem? Is it a person? Is it a procedure? Is it something in the product? And you check every element. Uh, sometimes you'll find two or three things are out of alignment. And if you bring them into alignment, things begin to improve. But don't think of the surveys as your final score. The most important number for us to be watching in this industry isn't did we get a 91 or a 92 on our orientation program or you know, did we get a 94 or a 93.5 on our design appointment. What we want to be looking at is how many referral sales did we get. That's where the money's at. If your customers are referring other people to you, even if they themselves had a complaint or two, they like you enough to send them to send you a colleague or a friend or a relative, that says something. A customer can complain about a couple of things, and they can be really enthusiastic about that complaint and still turn around and send you their friends. One of the worst customers I ever worked with. And the woman was an absolute nightmare. She referred two of her friends to us, and they both, both purchased from us. The original customer came back later with another set of complaints that were completely unreasonable. And I, I was working in warranty, and I said, you know, your home is 18 months out of warranty. We're not fixing a stain on your carpet. <laughs> well, she says, I'm not referring any more of my friends. And honestly, my first thought was, oh, thank God, your friends are just like you. So <laughs> this, we, we have to look at this, take a step back, and realize if your satisfaction ratings are 88% or above, you're above average. For the nation. Don't beat yourself up if you've got 95 instead of 96 or if you've got 94 instead of 97. If you're in the 90s, you're doing very, very well. Just keep watching for what things can you fix, what patterns, what's the context, is it the product, is it our training. Customers will eventually spot something when you start hearing the same complaint or the same criticism over and over again. That's something you really want to take a look at. If you have one customer out of 100 complain about, well, there weren't enough colors of carpet to choose from, that may or may not be the end of the world. Uh, if you have 18 out of 20 customers telling you the same thing, you probably better be talking to your carpet supplier about getting more choices out there. Oh, thank Anything you. Anything else? We have one last question, and it kind of falls. It's a natural progression from um, the last question we have. Robert's asking, what is a reasonable expectation for buyer referrals as a percent of sales or closings? 
rule of thumb is in the industry is we should have one third of our sales from drive by traffic, one third from realtors, and one third from referrals. I seldom see builder achieve those numbers. The company I worked for, which was one of the best builders I've ever encountered, and unfortunately I didn't know it at the time because I had nothing to compare them to, their rate of um, referrals was about 15%, and 67% of our sales were realtor sales. So every market is different. What you want to be looking at is where are you now and are we progressing in a positive way uh, that makes us feel proud about what we're doing. Don't get too locked into the numbers uh, that, you know, we have to have this many referrals. That number is going to fluctuate depending on where you're building, what product you're offering, your particular market, and all of those things feed together. So there's so many variables in this, it's difficult to give hard and fast rules. End of the day, if most of your customers would say, good job, we like your house, we like you, we'd recommend you, you're probably doing a lot of things right. That doesn't mean you can't continue to improve because all of us always can. But I, I, I see many, many builders get too wrapped up around the survey scores and, and too wrapped up around you know, the minute details of, oh, we got an 88.1 instead of a 90.2. Um, the idea isn't that the survey scores are the be-all and end-all. That is, They are a learning tool. They alert us to something that we're screwing up. They compliment us when we do something well. Uh, so think of it in those terms. Now, your overall rate of sales should be continually growing. As you build a customer base that is mostly satisfied people, you should always be having the opportunity to sell more and more homes. I've actually had a few clients who didn't want to do that. They got to a certain size. They were comfortable managing that size. They were successful, and they wanted to stay there. And they'll sell maybe 50 or 100 homes, and when they get to that point, they stop selling for the rest of the year, which is really kind of an astonishing concept, but it is out there. So there's lots of different ways of looking at this. Don't wrap yourself too tightly around to keep your mind open and keep using your imagination. Use your customer surveys and all of their feedback, including the percentage of referrals, as a learning tool. The referrals are also profitable, but if your referral rate is gradually increasing, you're doing something right. Well, thank you so much, Carol. I appreciate the time that you spent with us this morning. We had an attentive group pretty much for the entire time. I, I, I think we had a couple people drop off at the last minute, but everything you gave us today was um, meat on the bones for sure and um, hopefully you guys all got something from this today if you have any further questions you'll be getting a follow-up email tomorrow it's going to be coming from zoom it will have carol's email information feel free to email her with any other questions um, cindy toom says that um, that it was fantastic and thank you so much for spending time with us today carol um, but if you need anything else you can contact me i can help you get connected with carol you'll have an email sent with her um, I believe she's still doing some consulting and working with some builders. Um, is that correct, Carol? It is correct. My um, travel schedule has certainly be, been curtailed. As a matter of fact, the last time I traveled for the purpose of doing a seminar was the <laughs> Chuck Shin Summit in Miami-Dade County in Florida. <laughs> Yes. So uh, <laughs> I've been on the ground for quite a while, but I, I have started doing live seminars in Colorado. So that's a step in the right direction. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're all going to continue to stay healthy and move forward pulling out of this thing. It has been an adventure. Yes, and again, I sure. thank you so much for setting this up and moderating and gathering this fantastic audience. And um, I encourage all of you to feel free to reach out to me via phone or email if you have follow-up questions. Um, today or a month from now. Hearing from folks like yourselves on the front line is how I stay in touch with what's going on out there. So I appreciate that contact. Thank you so much, Carol. And um, I might connect you with um, Mr. Robert um, after our after we're done on this call. He has a couple questions That for would you. be just fine. Please do that. I will look forward to talking with him. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.